Bible, and I hope you do. That's the sword of the Spirit, you know. You don't go against an enemy like the devil with just your uh, thought. You need the book. The book of John, chapter 19, verse 1, if you'd like to stand with me this morning. The Gospel of John, John the Apostle, John chapter 19, and verse number 1. John 19, verse 1, the divine text says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Father, bless and anoint your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Pilate had been warned by his wife that she had had a dream to have nothing to do with this just man. Pilate knew that he was being used by these Jews. He understood that, but he also understood that being the procurator of Judea, it was his place to keep the Pax Romana, or the peace of Rome. So he understood that, that he would have to answer to Tiberius if he did not do his job correctly. We find in tradition that, uh, that, uh, that Pilate committed suicide a few years after this happened. Apparently it weighed so heavily on his soul that he could not bear what he had uh, allowed to happen there. Apparently Pilate had a sense of justice and just and what was right. This is why he said to these people, even though I'm going to let you take him and crucify him, there's nothing wrong with this man. I find no fault in him. And I want you to keep that in mind today because he was tried by the highest court that Rome had there at that place. And he said, I find no fault in this man. And I want to preach you a message this morning entitled, I find no fault in this man. Me. Amen. I've checked him out now since 1973. I've known him personally. He's been with me on the mountain. He's been with me in the valley. He's been with me in the good times and the bad times. He's been with me when I'm lying flat on my back in the hospital. He's been with me when I'm shouting and glorifying God. He's been with me every step of the way since 1973. He came to me in total darkness, lost without God, didn't know who I was, where I came from, or where I was going. But conviction came on my soul. Thanks be unto God for that, because that changed my life. It was then that I came to Christ, repented of what I was, and God saved my soul. So, I say to you this morning, I find no fault in Him. There's no fault in His birth. Matthew chapter number 1 verse 23 says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us the Lord Jesus Christ is the virgin born son of God don't tell me you're a Christian if you deny and reject the virgin born get away from me you don't have a clue what a Christian is the son of God is virgin born amen I find no fault in his growth in Luke chapter number 2 verse 51 says and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I can't imagine how the father felt as he watched his son grow in manhood. I can't imagine what went through the mind of the angels as they watched this boy that they had sung glory to God and praised at his birth when the heavens were filled with the angels singing glory to God in the highest and on, pe on earth peace, goodwill toward men. But he grew in wisdom and stature. There's all kinds of perverts out there, one by the name of Nodovich, that teaches that during these silent years where the scripture does doesn't say anything when he was about 12 13 all the way to 30 years of age 
Not a word in the Bible. The silent years. But we've got these reprobates and these, uh, these atheists and agnostics are saying that Christ went down into, into, the, into the east, into India or into Tibet and he was taught by a guru. And then he came back and all of the miracles that you saw him perform were performed by the power of the laws and the spirits and whatever he learned while he was there. You say, well, that's awful. Yes, but they believe that today. This is one of the things you have to deal with as a Christian. You've got to understand that they have cast upon your Bible... All of the religions of the world are saying about your Bible that it's, oh, it's okay for you. It's all right if that's what you believe. But there's a greater truth and a greater light that you'll find in this Bible. And all of the religions of the world are looking for this light. They're searching for the light. My dear friend, He is the light. Amen. Amen. And I, my friend, find no fault in His anointing. Matthew chapter number 3, the Bible says in Jesus... When he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Amen. This is God the Father saying to his creation, I love him, and he has satisfied every demand of holiness that I've placed upon him. For the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is holy, holy, holy. And the Lord Jesus Christ met that criteria, met that demand, met that standard. And therefore the Father had to say, I'm well pleased in him. I want to see you this morning. So am I. I am well pleased in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've sought him out since I said to you since 73. And I've never found one blemish in him. Amen. The Bible says in Matthew chapter number 4, I find no fault in his testing. The scripture says, Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Boy, what do you think, preacher? What went on for 40 days and 40 nights? I don't know. But I do know this. I do know that for 40 days and 40 nights, Satan hounded him. He hounded him. And the weaker Christ got, the more Satan hounded him. And at the end of 40 days, the Bible says he was in hungered. And this is when Satan came to him and started quoting Scripture. Have you ever been a hungered? Have you ever hungered for spiritual things? Have you ever come up to a wall and where you can't go any further with God? And then the scripture starts coming to your mind and coming to your ear. Satan will mock you with the word of God. He'll wear you out with the promises of God. And then you don't see the promises come to life. You don't see them materialize. And you say to yourself, what's going on? Has God forsaken me? The greatest thing Satan can do to a Christian is make him think God has forsaken him and God doesn't love you anymore. That if he's able to get that into your mind, he will undermine your faith and he will destroy your trust in God. All he has to do is undermine your faith, your trust in God, and you will come apart like I would and like all the rest of us. The glue that holds me together is not how I feel. I don't feel good. It's not what I accomplish. The glue that holds me together is that I know the character of the one that I believe in. I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. I serve a good God. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lord. Amen. Somebody said you're preaching too hard, preacher. That's okay. If I drop right here in front of you this morning, I will have finished my course. I will have run my race. And I've got to do what is in my soul. The book and I am, my dear friend, satisfied with his ministry. In Mark chapter number 1, the Bible said he had power over demons. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, let us alone. Watch this now. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. I would that most of the professors out here in these Bible colleges knew that. I would that most of the preachers in the pulpits in America would know that. They, the demon knows something that they don't know. There's more truth coming out of hell here than comes out of most pulpits. 
Amen. There's more truth coming out of hell than comes out of most pulpits in this country. These demons said, Thou art the Holy One of God. Amen. Do you agree with that? Amen. I agree with it. And the Bible said, He rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commandeth even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Amen. Have you ever dealt with an unclean spirit? I sat up there in that office a few years back and talked to a family that had stuff happening in their house and more than one of them had dealt with it. You're talking about a family of four or five people and every one of them practically had dealt with spirits in that house. And they came to me, they couldn't go to their pastor. They couldn't go to their pastor because their pastor was nice and clean and clean cut. And they had this good fundamental Baptist. You know, have you ever put blinders on horses? Yeah. You know what that is? It's like this. You, want, you don't want him looking to, he's liable to see something he wants to nibble on down here, you know. So you put a blinder on him and you got him, you got him corralled to go forward. And this is what's going on in the churches today. They're dead, my dear friend. They think that by organization and by ability and by their and, and by and by what all they gather together that that gives them power. They're twice dead and plucked up by the roots. If you got that going on in your house, go to God with it. If that's going on in your life, take it to the Lord, because you're dealing with an intelligent spirit being, and sometimes it'll come upon you when you least expect it. So what do you do, preacher? You do what is necessary. You cry out to the Holy One of Israel. And you plead the blood covenant against it. And let me tell you something. That night in Egypt when the death angel passed through and that blood was over the doorpost and lintels, he could not cross that blood covenant. And if you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you plead that blood covenant and then get behind it. And put it between you and the devil. And he cannot cross it. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter number 9. He has power over death. While he spake these things to them. Behold there came a certain ruler and worshipped him. Saying my daughter is even now dead. But come and lay thy hand upon her and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him. And so did his disciples. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house. And saw the minstrels and the people making a noise. He said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. Boy, boy! But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand. And the maid arose, and the fame hereof went abroad into all the land. Professional workers in death. They hired professional mourners to come in and make great lamentation. Because the idea was the more they cry, the more they lament, well, the more important that the person was. Yeah. But oh, my dear friend, when the Prince of Life walks into the midst of death, something's got to give. Something's got to give. Nobody ever died in his presence. And if he stayed around a place long enough, everybody would be raising from the dead. Amen. All he has to do is say the word and you'll rise from the dead. <laughs> Some of you are twice dead and plucked up by the roots. But if the Holy Ghost comes upon your soul and you feel something from above you, that's glory to God, that's greater than you, then my dear friend, conviction will come and raise you from the dead. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Felt like a bolt of lightning going through me up here. Amen. He'll raise you from the dead. That's what's wrong with religion. Oh, it's a sickening excuse for the truth. That includes fundamental Baptist religion. It stinks in the nostrils of God. Well, what are you, preacher? I'm a Bible believer. Matthew chapter number 20. He had power over disease. They departed from Jericho. A great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. 
And the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. Why? Did it, did it interfere with their religious profession, processional? But they cried the more, God bless them. <laughs> Amen. 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 Shut up. You're not part of this service. Just keep praying. Just keep glorifying God. Just keep calling on His name. Shut up. You're not a big name. Just keep praying. Just keep calling on God. He'll hear you. He'll reach forth and touch you if you'll call upon His holy name. He says, call unto me. I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Amen. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. That includes all of the religious garbage that you get paraded in front of you today. Remember, folks, you may never see me again after this service. I may never make it back to Temple Baptist Church. God may call me out of this world. I could go at any minute just like any of us could. You could. I could. We don't have... How many of you really know you're going to be here tonight? Raise your hand. Good. Nobody raised their hand. I'm glad. You don't know. None of us know. I'm glad we don't. How many of you would like to know the exact day and hour and moment that you're going to die? Raise your hand. No hands go up. Good, you're smart. <laughs> I wouldn't want to have that hanging over me, would you? You get up out of the bed in the morning, well, today is it. This is my last day on earth. Boy, wouldn't that be awful? I'm glad he holds that in his hand. Aren't you? But let me tell you something, folks. I am a mortal being. And this body goes back to the ground from which it came. But my soul and my spirit will sail off into the presence of God. Long before the undertaker comes to get my mortal frame, I'll be gone. He has power over disease, the blind. They departed from Jericho and a multitude followed. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Have you noticed how in the New Testament the Lord rewards perseverance? Have you noticed that over and over and over and over and over again? He rewards perseverance. They, I mean, they get put away by the religious leaders. They get shut down by this crowd. They get shut down. Hold your peace. Be quiet. You're bothering the master. And they just said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Yeah. Try that sometime. Yeah. Don't give up. Don't Go give ahead. up. Keep crying unto him. And he, my friend, can answer your prayer. John chapter number 5 and verse number 6 says, And Jesus saw him and knew that he'd been a long time in that case. He saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Where was that said? Anybody remember? The pool of Bethesda. 38 years he'd been there. And the troubling of the water when the angel came down. And when he tried to get up and get to the water, somebody beat him. So for 38 years he was pushed aside, get out of the way. And then the Lord shows up and says, Wilt thou be made whole? It's amazing when you look at the questions he asks. Look at chapter number 20 and verse number 32 of Matthew. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I should do unto you? Man, if I ask you that question this morning, what do you want God to do for you? What do you want? Well, I want money, preacher. You don't you know what you need then, do you? Well, I want friends, preacher. You get the Spirit of God in your soul. Get right with God. You'll have new friends. Real friends. Here's the bottom line. We don't really know what we need. We just need the Lord. We don't need what He can give us. We need Him. Amen. We need Him. In Luke chapter number 17, it came to pass as he went into Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee, entered into a certain village. There met him ten men that were lepers. They stood afar off and lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. I just have a feeling that they said it over and over and over and over and over again. But they couldn't come close to him. But they could cry out to him. You can do the same thing today. You hooked on dope. You've got a court date coming. You've lost your job. 
You, you've, been in, you were dead, you've been unfaithful in your marriage. Your wife's suing you for divorce. Your children are hooked on drugs. On and on and on and on it goes. What of a do, preacher? Crying to me. Let me ask you a simple question. How long does it take you to figure out that you've made a mess of everything? Right? You've made a mess of everything. So what do I do, preacher? Turn up to the Lord. Call unto God. Call unto Him. John the Baptist, one of the best men ever walked the face of the earth. The Lord said, Them are born of woman hath not risen or greater than John. Here's what John said. Matthew chapter number 11. It came to pass when Jesus made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and preach in their cities. And when John had heard in the prison how the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. John the Baptist went through the same thing we all go through. For one thing, he doubted his calling. Was all this in vain for preaching for Christ? All this a waste of my time? The Bible said he's not in, he's not to, what is the word there? To, to forget your faithfulness. I can't quote the scripture verbatim, but it simply says, he will not forget the ones who are faithful and serve him. Right. Amen. Yeah. God won't do it. I find no fault in his sacrifice. Matthew 27, they crucified him, parted his garments, casting lots. Matthew 26, 28, verse 6, he's not here for he's risen. Matthew, Luke 24, verse 5. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Here we go questions again, this time from angels. Acts chapter number 1. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, here's another question, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Now let's try to answer those last two questions. Why seek you the living among the dead? You ever been to dead church? What gives you life, preacher? Once it becomes the habitation of God through the Spirit, and you welcome the Holy Ghost into this house. How do I do that, preacher? When he comes to you, don't grieve him. Don't quench him. Cleanse yourself. Allow the blood of Christ to cleanse you. Get right with God. Get your heart right. Get your, get your, get your little petty differences and knick-knack and backbiting and all of that. Get that stuff if you've got to come down. Come, come down here. And pour your soul out to God. Once you've got a bunch of people that get to you, it doesn't take too many. Because it's like fire. It doesn't take too much to light a good fire. You get a few that gets right with God. It's, it's, it's like a magnet. It draws other people. Because isn't that what you're looking for? Don't you want to see that in people? Don't you want to see that? Here's what's happening, most people. You're accustomed to religious entertainment. And you won't let the Spirit of God work in your heart. You get up and go on Sunday morning, come to church, spend so much time, smile, shake hands, you know. Like Ed Blue used to say, psh, psh. come in, smell good, you know, look good, how beautiful I am, what a spiritual Christian I am. Walk out the door and the minute you hit the parking lot, your mind is on anything but God. Amen. Amen. When you come in here, you're in a place where Christians are gathered. This means that Holy Spirit is concentrated in here. Amen. Amen. I believe there's a bunch of saved people in here, brother. I firmly believe that. Every one of you that are born again, you've got the Holy Ghost in you. And when you come together with one accord and one mind, it'll shake the earth. That's what he said in Acts chapter number 2. They were in one place with one accord. And the Holy Ghost came down upon them. Cloven tongues like a fire. 
And they spake the word of God. That's what we want, don't we? What are you waiting for? Just come down and talk to him today and say, Lord, I've got a lot of animosity. I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of baggage. You don't have to remember everything. As long as your heart wants to be right with God, he'll help it get right. If you come down to him this morning and say, Lord, you know, I'm getting tired of going to church and it's just all mental. I get nothing out of it. And I go home and I turn around and I go back and do the same thing again. And it's not doing a thing for me. Well, I can't change that. No preacher can. God didn't put that in our power. But if you'll come today and talk to the Lord about it, He'll do something for you. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you went home today with the same joy you had when God saved you? How many of you know what joy I'm talking about? Once you ever get a hold of a born again believer, he'll all, he or she will always be born again. And they will never forget that first encounter they had with God. And they will never forget that joy that flooded their soul. They'll never forget that. Nobody can take that away from you. That's yours. That was God's down payment. That is the earnest of the Spirit. That's Him letting you know, I heard you. I've saved you. I've given you the Holy Spirit now as the earnest, the guarantee. He's going to be with you until I come and get you. But you grieve Him. You quench Him. You cover Him up. And He's sensitive. And so we'll need to get that heart right. Won't you do it? Just come down here and pray. You don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to tell me why you're coming down here. You don't have to come down here. You can go over here. You can go out in the yard. You can go down here in the field. You can go anywhere you want to. That's the good thing about Christians. This is not holy. This is not holy here. There's nothing holy about this. He's holy. Every place, if your heart's right with God, every place you put your foot, that's holy ground. Holy ground. Holy ground. That's the, great, that's the great blessing of being born again in the church of God. Father, bless your word. Thank you, Lord, for being with me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Now, bless your word and bless those that have heard it. Lord, you can do what you want to do now, Father. The messenger's finished. I've done what you've called me to do. I'm done. I can't change anybody, Lord. You know that. I won't even try to. I'm going to fool myself with that. I'm not going to change anybody. But your word will. I have full confidence in the seed that's been sown. Maybe I watered today. Maybe some other faithful man of God has already sowed the seed. Maybe they're coming into this house this morning and I'm watering it then. Well, Father, I'm, I'm privileged whatever, whether I sow or whether I water, whether I break up the fallow ground, wherever you use me, that's irrelevant. I'm just thankful that I'm here. In thy name I pray. Amen.